producing laws is not an easier problem than producing cars or food. So if the government's incompetent to do a good job of producing cars and food, why do you expect it to do a good job of producing the legal system within which you are then going to produce the, the cars and the food? I'm Paul Fine with Reason TV. We're here at Libertopia in San Diego, California, and we're talking with David Friedman, a scholar at uh, the Santa Clara University Law School, an economist, an author, a novelist, and of course, the son of Milton Friedman. Welcome. Thanks for being with us, David. Thank you. You've probably been asked this about 10,000 times over the last, I guess, 40 years of your life. Uh, uh, what is anarcho-capitalism, and how do you differentiate between that version of anarchism or anarchy and other sort of more leftist conceptions. The term anarchy gets used by a variety of different people in different ways. But I would have said that for the ones who I would say really are anarchists on the left, the real problem is what economists call the coordination problem. That you have a society with many millions of people. Doing anything requires the cooperation of a large number of those people. Uh, somebody's got to harvest the food, turn the food into cereal, deliver it to you, get the milk, etc., etc. And how do you coordinate them? So the anarcho-capitalism version is you just expand the way we coordinate things a little bit farther to include the things government now does so that you have in effect law and law enforcement and dispute arbitration and such produced on the market the same way cars and food are. That, it seems to me, is a much more believable story than to say that somehow people in an unexplained way will coordinate their activity to produce everything right. Oftentimes libertarians will, will talk to anar anarcho-capitalists and they'll, they'll butt heads and such. What, what to your mind is sort of the difference between a sort of libertarian conception of, of the way society should work and an anarcho-capitalist? Well, I would have said that anarcho-capitalism is one form of libertarianism uh, that we sometimes distinguish anarchists from minarchists, meaning people who want not much government but some. And the fundamental problem with the minarchist position, I think, and this was the way I started my talk today, is that they believe that governments are incompetent to produce food and cars and housing and stuff, and that therefore the right way to run a society is by private property and trade under a framework of laws that make all that possible. But they're then relying on the government to produce that framework of laws producing laws is not an easier problem than producing cars or food. So if the government's incompetent to do a good job of producing cars and food, why do you expect it to do a good job of producing the legal system within which you are then going to produce the, the cars and the food? What did your father uh, make of your sort of anarchist leanings? I think basically his view was that the institutions I described might work but probably wouldn't. And my view was they might not work, but probably would. So it wasn't a very sharp uh, disagreement. Can you point to a particular kind of era or time and place in history where you'd had some sort of an approximation of an anarcho-capitalist regime? Or are there indications, say, even in privatization movements today, where you see bubble, you know, sort of a bubbling up of these ideas? Elements of it have existed in many societies. Uh, I don't know of any full-blown version. One of the societies I discussed in the book in the second edition is Saga Period Iceland. And that was a society where there was a legal system, there was a court system, those were both government, so to speak, but there was no executive arm of government. So once you got your verdict, you had to enforce it. Uh, and that was an example of what I would describe as a feud system. The feud system is basically a decentralized rights enforcement system where the sort of simple version of a feud system is you do something wrong to me, I threaten to use violence against you, and the society is so organized that that threat is much more effective if you really did do something wrong than if you didn't. Elements of a feud system exist today. If you think about things like the patent fights going on in the high-tech world, that's sort of a feud system where I'm not going to attack you with guns, I'm going to attack you with lawyers, but, or in a sense what keeps you from attacking me is the fact that, that I'll attack you if you do. Uh, there's a very interesting book by Robert Ellickson, who's a Yale Law professor, called Order Without Law, which describes in modern day America, a few hours from where I live, an area where part of the legal rules uh, ignores the laws of California and are based on local community norms. And they're really enforced by private action. So I think features of what I describe have existed in lots of contexts, but I don't think the full-blown version has existed anywhere.
One of the things that strikes me as interesting about sort of restitution-based legal systems is that sort of magically victimless crimes disappear. Is that an attractive uh, an aspect, or how, what do you think about that? I'm not sure that restitution is the essential feature, because you could imagine in an anarcho-capitalist society there might be some crimes where it wasn't practical to make people pay damages and you therefore had to execute them or lock them up or something else instead. It is unlikely that I will be willing to pay as much to keep you from using drugs as you are willing to pay to be able to use drugs if you want to use drugs, and ditto for all the other victimless crimes, and therefore it would be surprising, though not impossible, if such a market generated such laws. But it could, if you imagine, if people's feelings are strong enough. That's why I like to say that anarcho-capitalism is not by definition libertarian. That, that anarcho-capitalism is libertarian is a prediction, not a definition. The last question I have for you is, you've been around this movement for a long time. Uh, it, you know, libertarian ideas are in one dimension much more popular than ever before. Many young people are being turned on by these ideas. Ron Paul has become a hero to many people. Your father is a, you know, a hero to many more people every year, it seems. At the same time, our government's in trouble, Europe's in trouble. Uh, what, are you optimistic about the future? What do you make of the current trends? I think that usually everything is, things are going in both directions at once. That things are getting better in some ways and worse than others is the usual pattern. It's also true internationally. That the really big positive trend, I think, is China and India. Uh, and they, not that they are very libertarian, but that they are much more free market than they were 30 or 40 years ago and are becoming much richer as a result. And I think most people can see the writing on the wall for that. So that the story that was widely accepted in the 1960s, which is that the only way poor countries are going to get rich is to have a strong central government and central planning and preferably lots of foreign aid, is much less believable now than it was then. The good part about things like the present European problems is that governments may run out of money, and when governments run out of money, they're sometimes willing to consider selling off government firms and becoming uh, more private. That, that might happen, one can hope. Uh, but it might go the other way. I think it would be a disaster if Europe became one country, which is the other direction things are pushing towards with the EU problems. I think competition is a good thing for countries. I think probably the U.S. is too big. It might be better off if we were eight or ten different countries, assuming they had a reasonable degree of free trade and weren't fighting each other. Uh, and similarly, I think one of the virtues of Europe at the moment is that to a considerable extent the countries are competing with each other. Thank you very much, David. For Reason TV, I'm Paul Fine.